Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yoli Tang. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a terrific time. Um, as introduction, I am a designer with a made in New York fashion brand in this city for more than 30 years. Within a few blocks of my design room and store, we have, a, we have sample makers, cutters, pleaters, and a vast network of artisans who contribute to the vitality of the garment district. In 2008, a proposed rezoning by the city threatened the integrity and existence of this fine weave of entrepreneurs and creators. On behalf of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, in partnership with the Design Trust for Public Space and with the advocacy from the Municipal Art Society, we managed to stave off the proposed zoning changes. Good news, however, in spite of having identified the Garment District as an innovation and creative hub of great value to the city, the district is under continuous threat. We see around the neighborhood challenges to the survival of existing small businesses and industry, the same challenges that face any startups today. We at MAS have been concerned about the precarious balancing act that many businesses and industries face. How to remain competitive, continue to hire, and grow our businesses under real estate and zoning pressure. What steps must we take in order to sustain a creative entrepreneurial class? The role of New York City as a habitat for entrepreneurs is all of our concern and a particular concern of serial entrepreneur, MAS President Vince Poehler. Please welcome him back to the stage to lead this session on safeguarding the entrepreneurial city. Thank you. Okay, we're doing this on stools. Um, there are many entrepreneurs in the room. It's very hard for entrepreneurs to sit down. But we're gonna sit down, Rachel, and then we'll stand up and then we'll sit down. Thank you, Yoli, one of the city's uh, great uh, entrepreneurs and brilliant fashion designers and, and uh, an entrepreneur catalyst. So thank you, Yoli, for your leadership. Um, as Yoli uh, mentioned, um, and, and certainly during my time here at MAS, um, we've gotten involved in the campaign to support the Garment District, one of the city's most iconic, concentrated entrepreneurial neighborhoods, which has been in peril, as, Lo as Yoli said, due to land use and planning policies that threaten the granular nature of its ecosystem, where there are lots of independent vendors working in close proximity, able to be nimble and innovative because of the density and connection of the physical city that makes that possible. Then last year, our campaign to keep East Midtown economically diverse, same set of issues really, our work in Midtown West, and now Q, CUE, the Committee for Urban Entrepreneurship, which we announced last year and have been pulling together since with folks like these guys, people creating jobs and paying attention to what entrepreneurs are looking for in a city like ours. Uh, New York City is not alone in asking how we can make sure that cities, especially ones with the kind of real estate development pressures we have in certain parts, continue to enable entrepreneurship. Some of our peer cities in Europe, Asia, and the US, US are facing this too. This is a global challenge for competitive cities to ensure that their local communities and the neighborhoods that house them are able to thrive. So today's discussion is kind of Q's coming out party, a way to get more folks involved both here and online. And in March of next year, we will be working with MAS board member Carol Coletta, I think Carol's in the house, at the Knight Foundation, as well as the Brookings Institution, Goldman Sachs, and the World Bank to host Q2Q, a conference on entrepreneurship in cities. There, we will dig deep into this issue with our partners here in New York and in other places to identify the challenges entrepreneurs are facing and lift up the really smart things that come, that some cities are doing to reform policies, create hospitable environments, and grow new entrepreneurs. So, joining me in today's discussion are Rachel, Jefferson, Michelle, and Colin, in, seated in a different order than I just said. 
<laughs> so it's so great to have you guys all on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to begin with you, Rachel. And then what I'm going to do is like go to each of you and say something about you, and then I'm going to like let you say something, and then we're going to go like this. Okay? Great. Okay, go. So Rachel. Go. <laughs> We've been so excited to uh, recruit you to MASQ, our Committee on Urban Entrepreneurship, because of your thinking and work on entrepreneurship globally and locally in multiple settings here in New York, in Boston, in Chicago, full disclosure, Rachel and I go back a long way. Plus, you've been a social and business entrepreneur, and you connect with so many entrepreneurs at the early stage of their efforts. As someone so deeply involved in, and connected to startup thinking and culture, what are your thoughts about how cities either foster or inhibit entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism? I'm not going to let you get away with one question. Do some places get it better than others? And what do you think about city agencies picking startup winners and creating incentives to push certain <laughs> industries? Is that enough for you, Don? Okay. okay. Um, so the cities that I have to compare to really are, as he said, Boston and um, Chicago. And I think actually this may not be a popular perspective um, given this crowd, but I think in fact there's not a whole lot that you can do or anyone can do to change the most important factor, the environmental factor for entrepreneurs, which is the sort of zeitgeist, the city culture. So, and that has an enormous impact on the attitude toward entrepreneurs, the sense of um, appreciation for entrepreneurship. So, for example, Boston is very, very healthcare centric. It's also history obsessed and education obsessed. So, there's a positive, and then there are these countervailing factors. Chicago is, on the one hand, enormously Midwesternly generous both intra-generationally and between corporations and entrepreneurs like no other city I've ever seen. On the other hand, because it's a Midwestern city, they're very, very shamed by failure. And that creates, you know, you, there's nothing you can do about that. So in New York, you have the density and the fact that everybody wants to end up here if you're successful. And on the other hand, we're very impatient about success. And um, it's just so damn expensive. It costs so much to be poor here. <laughs> you know, uh, right, with, we, as we were saying this morning, with an increase in, in rents of 70% since 2000. Yeah. So the affordabil affordability issue, um, yeah. of obviously, of, of both work and living space in New York is a, is a huge challenge. So jumping over to you, Jefferson, um, your work in writing, you seem to be focused on breaking down some of what Rachel just said, trying to facilitate a more honest conversation about the complexity of entrepreneurship, the complexity of entrepreneurship in New York, particularly within immigrant, immigrant communities and how vital it is to the su success of certain neighborhoods and then to New York as a whole. Recently in Next City you wrote, avoiding an honest look at differences between immigrant neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods is one of the biggest weaknesses of urban planning and policy today. We are at a moment when our cities are experiencing ever-widening inequality and real social mobility seems even ever more fleeting. Meanwhile, we're avoiding a discussion about how some immigrants have dramatically moved up and failing to draw any general lessons from their experiences. We're also trivializing their success by not addressing it. Mm. What is it that you're observing and what are today's urban planners missing? Well. I think what doesn't get talked about enough is that technically all small business owners are entrepreneurs. And the vast majority of them never have access to an incubator or participate in startup competitions or are looking to disrupt anything. They're <laughs> trying to uh, get by. They're trying to make a living. And this sort of subsistence entrepreneurship is more and more apparent, especially way out in Easter Queens, where I'm from, and in the immigrant communities that are actually low income. And a lot of these low income people are starting businesses at a very high rate. And it's a hard and unenviable and scary way to make a living. But at the same time, you get the sense that maybe this is what it takes to have a resilient working class neighborhood these days. Are you seeing the, um, um, in, the in your observations, um, are you seeing much of an impact of the city's rezonings in certain areas and the, the change to the spatial city and how that's affecting 
some of the entrepreneurs, the businesses that you're talking about? There's certainly a lack of space for retail and other kinds of establishment spaces, but there, I think the most apparent way that you see it playing out is if you go to Flushing, you have the ground floor retail with all the restaurants and the bakeries and the supermarkets, but there's a less well-known second floor economy in uh, the space above all of those retail establishments. And those are full of travel agencies and insurers and lawyers and medical offices. And it really goes to show how, like what the demand for entrepreneurial space is that second floor retail could actually work to an extent. We could, that, that subject obviously could trigger an entire panel discussion. One of, the, one of the things that happens in New York, which really lights up the MAS switchboard, uh, is when um, uh, um, a block which might have housed several businesses, say between 90th and 91st on Columbus Avenue, on the east side to be specific, uh, becomes, uh, becomes a Duane Reed from corner to corner, um, or when a bank branch takes up, which are Every. most often vacuous empty <coughs> spaces, takes up an entire uh, uh, street block. And the changing character of the neighborhood, um, uh, that street level entrepreneurship is something that I know is of great concern to, uh, to many New Yorkers. Uh, Michelle, um, as an entrepreneurial strategist to both businesses and nonprofits, you work to forge the connection between mission and market, whether that's been with Games for Change or the Independent Filmmaker Project or so many other initiatives. How do you think entrepreneurship is faring in the city? Is the city adapting well enough to what seems to be a burgeoning entrepreneurial culture because of information technology and the ways in which we can live and work today and all those flexibilities? And can our physical environment keep up with and support how people need to live and work today? I packed some questions. Right. Too. I'm going to answer one. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Um, I think, just to kind of uh, echo what was just said, I think that there's a segment within the certainly media arts or arts community that doesn't self-identify as entrepreneur. And I think right now that's a huge lost opportunity. So when you think about people who are in the arts, frequently they're um, the founders of those kinds of organizations go out and start nonprofit organizations. And that lots of service industries related to the entertainment arts, they're completely disconnected from thinking of themselves as a social entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. And when you think about it, I'll give a concrete example. I met last week with a woman who runs an organization called Film Recycle Biz. Her, she was in the art department of uh, working on film and television sets and realized this is a, our, our industry, the entertainment, the movie making business is extremely wasteful. Why are all these props that are going into sets, why are they all being thrown into dumpsters? She created an entire business as a nonprofit that would take in these um, film sets, uh, shoots, you know, all these kinds of materials. She has a space out in Gowanus and she sells this stuff. But in order to get the material in, she needs to be a 501c3, so it's donated. She then, as part of her business model, also um, provides um, for transitional um, housing and things like that, provides uh, home. Who you know, does she sell it to? She sells it to the public. She sells it to other sort of low budget films and people who can't afford the expensive props or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you need an entire new kitchen, you can go over to her place and buy it if she has it under there. Under market. Under market, wildly mm -hmm. under market. Mm -hmm. And she also donates. So she, in essence, has created what some people might view as a, she's a social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, you know, she's telling me her problem. Her problem is she's a 501c3, which means she does not qualify for a lot of the small business initiatives that the city might offer. Um, and she also doesn't qualify for, mm -hmm. say, funding from Department of Cultural Affairs because she, you know, it's, it just doesn't qualify, you know? So she's in this kind of tricky spot where maybe if we started looking at some of these really committed, passionate leaders of certain kinds of nonprofits and started using language that was more inclusive, um, they might start to understand that they are really part of this entrepreneurial spirit that is also driving New York City. So that's just something to kind of throw mm -hmm. into the equation about there are people, I think, in the arts who particularly, when they hear entrepreneur, they think tech. Right. And that tech is not the only kind of entrepreneur that there is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's not clear. 
in a lot of the communications. I think that one of the things we're trying to achieve with, uh, with Q, entirely to your point, um, is that it's a discussion um, of both private sector and social entrepreneurs. And we tend to, uh, to want to you know, label and bucket um, everybody, but yet these lines are getting increasingly blurred and you can be both at the same time. And um, yeah, the tech sector has pretty much taken over the word entrepreneurship. Right. And, and governments have reinforced this because we have our economic development policies and our, and our incentives have so often gone to um, the tech sector. Um, one of the points of our garment district work and something that Yoli worked uh, very hard on is that the, the fashion industry, the garment industry in New York is this huge driver of both industry and creativity, but yet hasn't benefited from the kinds of incentives right. um, that other industries sometimes do receive from government. Not only has it not benefited, but it's that extraordinary ecosystem that supports it um, at any moment has the, has, could be wiped out because of a change in zoning that could uh, essentially rid it of the kinds of spaces that are very necessary for that bu bu business type of industry to thrive. So. Um, Anyway, I, um, I think that's a very important point uh, that you raised. So Colin, um, in many ways, you're the archetype social entrepreneur and also private sector entrepreneur simultaneously. So you are the specimen. Um, you've been fearless I try. about acting. Yes, would you just, would you, tur you turn okay. for us, please? Sure. Um, you've been fearless about acting on your passion and calling for change and about calling for inclusion when the city aims to change neighborhood zoning or approve new development plans. As an entrepreneur artist, you're focused on creating art that both delights and provokes, so your toolbox is different than many other activists. Beginning with Save Domino and now through working to create a for-profit business, Wikiburg, a civic platform on fostering col collaboration on the spatial city, what are the new sets of principles you want to see the city adopt as it zones and plans its future? What would you like to see New Yorkers do to prevent losing their neighborhoods to single or corporate use? Um, well, this is my first experience here. And I think out of the box, what New York has to do is work with your organization, um, Municipal Arts Society. Um, and second, I think... We'll we, take a round of applause. Yeah, 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 <laughs> right? Yeah, let's do that. Get the blood flowing. Right. Um, <laughs> but, and also, we have to understand what online and offline is today. And the thing that we work at at Wikiburg is how do we get online, offline interconnectedness? And this is really, really important. Um, if you look at what Dorsey and Zuckerberg and CARP have created, they created a social network. And that was like, for me, like the first step. The second, ne second step is a pro-social network. How can we make the internet smarter? How can we get the citizens in City Hall to connect? And how can we all work together? So these are the things that we, we work on at Wikiburg, and some of the things that we talk about is, for instance, zoning. How does zoning occur? Why does it occur? The use and bulk of this question is different when you go to New York versus Houston. Houston has no zoning. New York has a lot. So you know, if you look at these two different cities, how does that impact quality of living, right? So one of the things we look at is how can we get online participation how can we get people to come in and crowdsource best solutions for their community? So when you talk about principles, it's, it's about the city coming out and working with tech, working with people like us, working with civic organizations, working with nonprofit organizations, and we all come into a collaborative space that's also offline. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's baby steps, and I know we're kind of like on the leading edge of that, but uh, we, we'll be launching soon, so <clears throat> it's exciting. Well, um, Houston, Texas, also has no state income taxes. Right. So um, the, um, you know, we, it's interesting because we, some of us were talking backstage that we, we talk about innovation zones or, or incentives here in New York. Um, uh, and I, I can assure you as somebody who's done a fair amount of work in Texas that the conversation around innovation zones or incentives in, in Dallas or Austin or even Houston doesn't really exist because they have no state income tax. So, so certainly the growth of the tech industry and all that venture capital money um, that has flowed into Texas or into Austin in particular um, is there because that those, those capital investments are rewarded, you know, in the form of favorable and favorable taxes. Now we're in New York for a reason, but we are a very heavily taxed environment. 
heavily uh, um, regulated environment, and, and the cost of space here is certainly rising. Um, and uh, again, um, using the instrument of zoning as we continue to rezone the city, perhaps in favor of, uh, of luxury office and luxury housing, what is going to happen to entrepreneurship in New York? Because after all, isn't uh, this city as in its entrepreneurial history really truly when you break it all down, Jefferson, what's made it, what's made it what it is, what's made it great? Um, anybody care to, to comment on that? I'm looking all the way down the aisle because your, your beautiful work and your, the, the observations that you've been writing about with respect to um, what's happening in the neighborhoods in New York, not only uh, with respect to the importance of that type of economic activity today to, the, to those neighborhoods and uh, their uh, not only surviving in New York but moving up in New York, really it's that same activity among those same people that become the bigger businesses of tomorrow, but they've got to be able to see, they have to be able to be nourished. But I want to, I want to push back a bit on the conflation of small business and entrepreneurship and not like the whole thing, because it, it depends on what your goal is. If we're talking about simply creating sustainable, livable, resilient city, et cetera, then yes, but if it's about making New York hospitable, for entrepreneurs, like any market effort, you have to actually define your market in a meaningful way. And once you start conflating all of those sub-markets into a single market where they really don't have anything to do with each other, then I wonder whether we lose the goal if one goal is to make New York more aware first of who are entrepreneurs they're not the, just the tech entrepreneurs, but on the other hand, they may not be. It may not, that doesn't mean it just goes all the way across the spectrum. A, who are they? And then let's celebrate them and you know, make them heroes in their own city the way Chicago has very clearly. Um, I don't know that you can do that if you just define the whole spectrum and say all of you are entrepreneurs. Well, I think they have a lot to do with each other and you know, a lot of the sophistication that goes into market research or business planning that we take for granted when we think about tech firms and startup culture, that is not there at all for a lot of low-income entrepreneurs. And they could benefit from yeah. having that. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying in the immigrant community that what industry you work in depends on who picks you up at the airport. Right? Uh, like, <laughs> hey, your friend works in a nail salon, you're going to work in a nail salon. And when it's time for you to start a business, it's going to be a nail salon. So, like, the, there's, actually, <laughs> there's actually a lot of room where, you know, things that we take for granted, like basic marketing, basic yeah. business skills are just not being transferred. Yeah. Well, that's like, true with nonprofits, for sure. That's definitely yeah. true for nonprofits. I mean, I have to say, like, as a, a Chinese person, reading the English translated, you know, names of the Chinese dishes at restaurants is like a harrowing experience. They, <laughs> I, I don't oh, even know I'm what's going on there, that's right? And, and like, th that's that very basic marketing skills. And, and, th and those are good dishes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so really, uh, um, uh, an open uh, kind of climate framework for uh, entrepreneurship is what some of what you're talking about. Um, I think what Rachel is also um, adding to is a common language around our entrepreneurship and those of us in civil society organizations, activist organizations like MAS, as well as those of us in government, we're probably, we're making the condition worse because we tend to put everything in buckets, we tend to silo uh, these conversations uh, rather than really try to join them up. And what we are trying to do here at the MAS Summit and what we are trying to do through this committee work is try to, um, uh, to change, um, change those uh, patterns. Um, Rachel's comment, and, and Michelle's as well, makes me think about this, this notion of a more resilient city and what we mean by that. And resilience grew out of the environmental field, but also, of course, resilience is all about economic and social resilience. And would you rather trust the future of your neighborhood on, on 50, 
entrepreneurs who are invested and own businesses there about what to do in a crisis or some corporate entity that might have parked itself there a few blocks away or even government. Is that my choice? That, well, <laughs> you know, I, in some Not. cases, it, but some right. cases though, well, but you know, in some cases, um, it is a choice yeah. because we've made, we have made choices with respect to um, uh, the spatial city um, whereby the local businesses and activities that were there are no longer able to be there because of overlaying uh, choices with respect to, to uh, the use of physical property. Um, after Superstorm Sandy, um, and MAS was extraordinarily involved in the post-Sandy resilience work, as I think most everyone knows, and which has been, and something that's been talked about so much, it was really that cellular, that granular level, yeah. entrepreneurial fabric in neighborhoods, in those neighborhoods, they were the ones that were able to organize more quickly, were able to help one another, create responses while government and other institutions just kind of lumbered along. Uh, Colin, you're also looking at this when you think about um, the potential of your um, social activism as well as what you're trying to create with Wikibird. Jump in, you guys. Yeah, it's just one thing I keep on thinking about is what I call the balkanization of our community is I feel like there's so much economic segregation going on is that it's hard for us to assimilate. You know, we've lost this true grit of New York that was here when I first moved here and it's gone. And I don't see like this, in, this connective tissue anymore. It's eviscerated. So, you know, and I don't know what's gonna bring that back. And I think the only answer is we have to take it online because so many people are online today. And it's like, if we wanna sustain, if we wanna compete and sustain as the, one of the number one economies in the world, then we have to bring it online. What does bring it online mean? What does that mean? I mean, so much of the discussion, you know, this, this ability of social engagement has been lost. And I feel oh. like that, you know, when you, let's go back to Houston, for instance, it's one of the fastest growing cities in North America. It's the fastest growing market for millennials, Houston? right? Houston? Yeah. Wow. So what is that city going to look like in five to 10 years? Wow. How is that city Denver going? Denver and Houston. Yeah, right? Denver and Houston. <clears throat> millennials are not moving to New York, right? They, this was in the New York Times, I think, maybe three days ago, I think it finished like eighth or ninth. Why is that, right? Where, what are they doing in those cities, right? So Living. our platform's gonna capture all that, right? And then we're gonna be able to work with their government and say, this is what needs to happen. New York better jump on that ball. Are you saying they're not moving here because they can't afford it? They can't afford it. Mm -hmm. There's, wh what are they gonna move here for? They're gonna live out in the hinterlands. I mean, the price of land, millennials are gonna have to live in boats. You know, I mean, it's... I know some have lived in boats. Right. Yeah, right, you know, but, you know, so there has to be this exchange of, again, this online, offline interconnectedness. We have to, we have to take it to that level. And again, it's about working with nonprofits, civic, and tech resources all in one sandbox. You know, like, like um, I don't want to interrupt the applause. Um, <laughs> um, like every conversation here at the summit, right, the, we could spend the entire afternoon on this subject and we only have a few more minutes. And what I find particularly challenging about this conversation is it is so big and it is so clumsy. And one of the things that we're trying to work through in these Q meetups is to give some structure to this very conversation. We're invested in it because we know how important it is. Um, we've got to have a serious look. MAS has to be serious minded about what's happening um, at the entrepreneurial level uh, in New York City. And some people want to say that zoning doesn't really matter. Well, zoning matters a hell of a lot. Uh, because it is those choices that we make as a municipality about what to do with the space that we have, which encourages the uses. And those areas that have been kind of left alone, kind of, it's kind of interesting, are the ones that are the entrepreneurial hotbeds. And the, and the areas of the city that we have designed um, are the ones that seem to be less accommodating for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And organizations like yours, I know, was really interested mm -hmm. in trying to find mm -hmm both of your organizations trying to find that balance. Um, we're not against, we're not against the, the new and spectacular, but if we're not um, conscientious about taking care of what's here and protecting uh, these very, very important, uh, clumsy, maybe not for everyone, ecosystems, uh, then we're gonna be losing a heck of a lot. And we may be hitting you know, halfway down on the list and we're gonna be dropping very steadily, not to mention the fact 
that um, we're, um, we're eliminating opportunities for, for those New Yorkers that um, tend to, to kind of climb through um, small business and entrepreneurship to be able to, to improve their individual welfare and the welfare welfares of their families. So it is a very uh, difficult conversation, but it's one that we are, we're very um, committed to. Um, uh, Michelle, in your work in organizing independent filmmakers and in thinking about this issue, um, um, do you think that uh, um, the notion of, um, of uh, carved out innovation areas or innovation zones, the notion of um, kind of picking industries um, and trying to support those industries um, at the at the municipal level, at the government yeah. level, is that useful? I, I don't. I don't like the idea of picking industries. And I think that when you th when you think about film, first of all, a lot of independent filmmakers are no longer independent filmmakers. They don't even necessarily call themselves that. They're content creators. They're storytellers. And when you think about it, every industry in the city employs and is using people to help them tell their story. So in a in a weird way. Um, the industry, forget about whatever the city incentives are, the state incentives are, it's an industry in immediate disruption in terms of the way in which it's financed. So the Kickstarters and all these sort of, you know, like more the tech platforms have, have come into the sort of independent film world in a huge way and independent games, all of the, you know, sort of independent content creation spaces. Um, I just think you can't divorce the way the industry operates when you look at media, you know, sort of media, because there is a business that is being disrupted, just in terms of the way our content is delivered, what people expect or don't expect to pay for it. So that's a huge tension in, in sort of the content creator space. So if I have gone out and I've made a film or I've made something and it's now being sold and before it actually releases, you can buy it on, you know, bit download, it, download it for free, that's a problem. You have hurt me economically. So there's tensions between some of these, mm -hmm. you know, sort of tech platforms and content creator platforms. And I think they're totally separate from conversation. And they might relate to policy, but I don't know that an innovation space or zone for people who are fundamentally nimble and mobile and go where the work is, I don't know that an innovation, you know, that you can really place, park people there when the entire industry is so mobile and fluid, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Okay, of course we are out of time. So very, very quickly, um, um, what do you think? See if you can do this in a word. If you can't, it's okay. Go to the next person. <laughs> um, um, what would be the one thing that would best support uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, in New York City? Rachel. Uh, a top-down, to complement the bottom-up, a top-down campaign to make the city aware of how important they are and to give entrepreneurs a sense that we see you, we value you, this is your home. Jefferson. I'm going to go back to Jane Jacobs because it seems like the venue for it. But uh, <laughs> my favorite book of hers was always The Economy of Cities. And in that book she says, there's, there are no causes of poverty. There are only causes of prosperity. Just like cold is the absence of heat, poverty is the absence of prosperity. And that might sound like semantics, but I think what she's really going for here is there is no replacement for the cold, hard work of creating new jobs from where there weren't, new, from the, where there weren't jobs before. And Flushing is an example of a place where people have willfully ignored poverty in favor of concentrating on the causes of prosperity. And we have poverty and we have barriers, but we're all also seeing prosperity now. Well, very fitting that you um, referenced Jane Jacobs. If it were Robert Moses, we would have had to excuse you from the stage. Um, uh, Michelle? I'd say mind the gap of who you're, who's not being included in the conversation at the moment. Colin, you're in cleanup. I'm in cleanup. Um, for me, if entrepreneurs want a chance in this city, you can't solve the problem at the level it's created. We have to take it to a new level. We have to attain higher, and that's the online space. Very provocative. Okay, with that, <laughs> thank you guys so much. Stay with this conversation. We're just beginning it. Thank you.